grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a, a good week. There's been some fine weather when the sights, sounds and fragrances of spring have entered into our experience. And there was some hopeful news coming from the Scottish government that the lockdown is beginning to, to ease. Bear in mind, though, that in the midst of the, the things that encourage us, there are people who are still struggling and still anxious in the midst of this pandemic. And our hearts go out to them today. And we look to God to provide us with ways to support and help those who are finding this time difficult. But I hope that wherever we're placed, on this Lord's Day morning that we'll find the resources that we need in this moment to go forward together in faith. Now, I did mention last week that we were hopeful that it would be possible for us to come back into to live worship on a limited basis. We're not absolutely sure at the moment about a date, but I would ask you to keep your eyes on the church website. And also I'll make an announcement next week uh, as to what our intentions are with that regard. And could I emphasize also, as I did last week, that though there will be limited live worship in the church, hopefully we're continuing with these recorded services. You don't need to be in doubt about that. So let's now worship God together as we sing together how deep the Father's love for us. Once again, we turn to the psalmist, folks, who will lead us into prayer. He says, when I consider your heavens, O Lord, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? 
Let us pray. God, our Father, we who occupy a limited space come to the God who fills the universe. We who struggle to understand come to the God from whom all wisdom flows. We whose achievements are always limited come to the God who created the earth in the beginning and will be there at the end to renew and revitalize. We who sometimes find it difficult to love come to the God whose love reaches out to all humankind. It's all too much for us to accommodate in minds that are so often shallow, distracted and self-absorbed. But we are grateful that we can focus on your son, Jesus, that he is revealed to us in your word, that your Holy Spirit establishes us in a relationship with him. Make this time of worship a moment of grace for each one of us, that our vision of who you are would be expanded, that our love for Jesus would be deepened, that you would lead us forward in the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a special good morning to all the boys and girls. I hope you've had a, a good week. I wonder if there were any special events that you had this week, like a, like a birthday. There are always birthdays happening, and it's good to celebrate them, and it's good to have people around us celebrating with us. I noticed that there was a very special birthday this week. I wonder if, if you did too. Dennis the Menace was 70 years old. Dennis the Menace has, we've had stories about Dennis for the last 70 years. And here's a, a, a copy of the very special Beano that came out this week dedicated to to Dennis. Here it is now. There you go. I don't know if there are any copies still left in the, the news agents, but I'll tell you, when I heard that this special event had happened, uh, I made sure that I got my copy of the, the Beano. Now, he, here's a wee word for the grannies and grandpas who are listening in to this. I hope you don't mind if I say a wee word to them. Guess how much a copy of the Beano costs these days. I'll tell you, because I was really quite taken aback. It's £2.75 for a Beano. And, you know, my mind went back to the days when I was first buying it, and I think it cost tuppence in real money. You know, and I don't know what that is in the present currency, but it just seemed to me to be quite uh, extraordinary. What could we buy for £2.75 when we were growing up? Anyway, never mind. Let's get back to the, the real business at hand, which is Dennis and his 70th birthday. But, you know, in all these years that we've been reading stories about Dennis and Menace, apparently he has always remained 10 years of age. His age has never, ever changed. He is forever 10 years. And that's the same with another fella that I've been reading for a long time. And here he is going to pop up on the screen. Well, I think you know who that is. That is Ur Wally. Now, the thing about Wally is he is actually 85 years of age. There have been stories about Wally appearing over the last 85 years. And he's always remained the same age. He's always remained, I think, probably the same age as Dennis in, in the stories, about 10 years of age. Now, I don't know how you think about that, remaining the same age for the, for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, for some of us, we have to get older. But that's not a, a bad, that's not a bad thing. 
there's a man in the Bible who was thinking about the passing of the years and he thought back to when he was just a baby and when he was growing up through all the different stages of manhood and he realized that at every stage God was present with him. God was teaching him wonderful things. God was showing him the kind of life that he should lead. And as he looked back over the whole course of his life, he was very confident that God was present and loving him and working out his good purpose in his life. I think that's a, a great thing for us to remember. Whether you're 10 years of, of old or whether you're the same age as me, which is, we can be sure that our God is with us in all our days. Now, we're going to sing a hymn, which really is about all of that because it's, it's a prayer. And it assures us that God is present with us when we have to face challenges in our lives or when we're celebrating the good things that happen to us. I think you'll, you'll know this, this hymn. Lord, today, if, Lord, I pray, if, today. Let's sing it together. Friends, let's read together in God's Word for the last few weeks now. We've been focusing on a passage from Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, which we'll read again. The emphasis this week will be on verse 15, where Paul says that what counts in the Christian life is a new creation. But let's read Galatians chapter 6 and from verse 12 to verse 16. Paul writes, Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Thanks be to God. And we read again in Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 3 and at verse 17. And we'll read through to the, to the first verse of chapter 4. Paul writes, 
Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern you gave us. Sorry, according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. And God will bless to us these ancient words, and we pray that the presence of his spirit now will expand our vision of who he is and the depth of his love for us. Let us pray. God, our Father, we give thanks to you for this season of spring in which we live and move at this time and the signs of renewal around us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would bring renewal to our lives as now we focus upon your word. We pray that your spirit would be working in us to establish more fully that pattern of living which has been modelled by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Like everyone else uh, in their Christian journey, I've, I've sometimes had moments of confusion with regard to my faith. I remember in my late teens, I came across a book. It was written by an Anglican bishop and it was entitled, But That I Can't Believe. The title was taken from a song by Sidney Carter, the author of Lord of the Dance and other songs. But in, in this book, the, the bishop addressed items of belief like the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus and the resurrection. And he was putting forward the, the view that really these things didn't need to be taken literally and that you could be a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ without, in fact, taking these things on board. Now, that was uh, a bit of a shock to me in some ways. It was one thing having to deal with questions from people outside the church with regard to your faith. But when it was coming from within, that seemed to me to be a totally different experience. I think that the, the bishop's aim was part of a, a tendency within the church to soft pedal on the miraculous side of Christianity in order to make it more palatable to modern minds. Now, whether that was the case or not, whether it was successful or not, it just produced a, a state of confusion within my own mind. But as I grew in understanding about the, the nature of the, the church over the years, I came to recognize that this had been a, a tendency within the church right from the very beginning. Paul, in his letter to the church at Galatia, was actually addressing a, a circumstance of confusion within the church. What was happening was that people with a pagan background were, were responding to the gospel and they were coming into the, the church having placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who revealed God to them, as the one whose death upon the cross provided forgiveness for their sins, as the one who assured them that they had a place in the eternal kingdom which would come upon this earth at the end of all things. 
they had embraced all, all of this. But then there were other people in the church who were saying, yes, this is, this is all very well. And, and you do have to, to place your faith in the, in the Lord Jesus who has done all of these things. But if you are interested in becoming a 100% Christian, then it's necessary for you to follow the traditions and the rituals of the Jewish faith. That way you'll be kept very tightly within the will of God. Now, Paul was absolutely horrified with, with this. He was convinced in his own mind what the centrality of the, of the, the, the Christian faith was. It's revealed in, in these uh, words that we've been focusing on in, in the past few weeks, where he says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul held that as the very core of the, of the Christian faith. And he was hearing about these people who are being pulled in, in different directions and not being absolutely sure what they should believe in the end. And what he was seeking to do in his letter to the church, churches in, in Galatia, was to reestablish Jesus Christ and him alone as the core of the Christian faith. What mattered to Paul more than anything else was that there should be no other factor involved and being wholeheartedly in Christ. Just that response to him as the saviour of the world. In the end, it was that belief that was bringing us to a new creation. That's what he says at the end of our reading today. What counts is the new creation and that flows into our lives, into the life of our communities and into the life of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ and his work for us. And that's what I want to stay with this morning, friends, this idea of the, of the new creation and how it comes upon us through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing which is of importance to us is to grasp that the new creation is personal. It's a personal thing. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the type of TV programme which takes things that have fallen into to disrepair and renews them. You know, it might be a, an item of, of furniture or jewellery it might be a whole house that's that's involved in this, but through the talents and the and the work of of talented people, these things that have fallen into disrepair, that are battered and broken down, they're made as as, as good as new. And you know that, in many ways, is how we need to view humankind. We stand as a race that needs to be renewed from within ourselves. We have fallen into disrepair and we need to be rebuilt. You know, that, uh, that's in many ways the, the, the experience that has, has, has been the common experience of humanity from the very beginning. It's interesting actually, when you look back on the experience of, of lockdown, and there have been many heartwarming stories of people and how they've cared for one another and how they've sacrificed for one another. But we've also heard stories of people who have exploited the conditions in lockdown for their own ends. How they've seek, sought to, to enrich themselves through the misery of other people. 
Now that dark side of humankind, that was something that, that, that the Apostle Paul was aware of within himself. He realized that in many ways he, he was a, a broken down ruin of a man. But he had found a way forward. He spoke of himself as being in Christ. And what he meant by that was that he had, he had realized who Jesus was. That he had responded to Jesus as the son of God. He stood in a relationship to him. He received forgiveness for his sins and also a way forward, a motivation to live in step with his spirit. And he was convinced that this was like becoming a new creation. He actually, he actually says that at, at one point in one of his letters. If, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. And his fellow apostles, John and Peter, would, would agree with that because they spoke about, about Christians having experienced a new birth. It was as radical as that. Coming into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are being rebuilt. You are being fashioned according to the pattern of his life. And so you can imagine when Paul is confronted with these people who are saying, yes, it's Jesus, but you also have to, to obey traditions and rituals. And Paul is saying, no. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found. He reveals God to us. From him flows the forgiveness and renewal that we all need. And from him flows the promise of the new creation we will enjoy at the end of all things. And this helps us to understand where we are going as a church. Because when we're talking about the new creation, yes, it's a personal thing. Yes, it's a, a communal experience. But it's also universal. The new creation is a universal project. You know, the, the, there can be very few more heartening experiences than to, to take up a project, to get involved in something that carries with it a lot of hope, a lot of expectation, a lot of aspiration, and then to experience a shadow falling on your mind. And the question arises, are we getting anywhere with this? It doesn't look as if we're getting anywhere. I was reading just through the week there, a very moving story of a, of a young nurse. She was writing this her, herself, telling of her experience of working in a cancer ward for children and how she was going in every day and, and working with these kids. And, and she had come to the point where she was asking herself, was she actually making any difference? Was she making the difference to these children's lives. Some of them just got sicker and others died. Am I getting anywhere with this? Now, it was sad to, to read that, but I think it's also healthy to express these views because, or these feelings rather, because you see that there's still that aspiration within that young woman to make a difference in the lives of the children that have been placed in her care. And that is something that we need to hold in our hearts as 21st century members of the Jesus movement, because we can get so easily discouraged. We can feel, as someone once said to me, as if we're wading through treacle, that we're not having the impact that we so much desire upon our community, upon our nation, upon the world. 
but we need to hold in our hearts this great truth in times like that, that our Lord Jesus Christ is risen and he's present with us. And that's not just a, a, a message for Easter, it's a, a message for every single day of our lives. And, and to, to see the resurrection of Jesus, not just as a sign for individuals or a sign for, for faithful communities, but it's a sign for the world. The resurrected Jesus stands at the center of the, the, the universe as a sign of what God is seeking to do with the whole of his creation to bring it out of darkness, to bring it out of corruption, to bring it out of death, in order to establish that reality where Jesus is Lord of all. That's the, 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 the great vision at, at, at the, the end of Ephesians chapter one of the whole of creation being united in our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so good for us to focus on those passages and in scripture for our encouragement as we seek to go forward in our witness, friends. What about focusing this Easter on that great chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, where we, we see the, the implications of the resurrection of Jesus unfolded for us as individuals, as a community, and as a world. And I love that vision that Paul places at the very heart of that chapter, of Jesus at the end of, of all things, cleaning up the whole of creation, evacuating everything from human experience that has ever caused pain, and then handing over a cleaned up earth to his father. Because this is where we are going, friends. Uh, faith, uh, Christianity is not just there to, to give us an individual buzz. It's not just to give cre cre communities cause to, to clap their hands and, and to sing choruses. The Christian faith involves a sense of God gathering us up as his people and installing us as a renewed people to enjoy a renewed creation at the end of all things. Now, it's not easy to hold out visions like, like that. In, in difficult days, not least in the midst of a global pandemic. But remember Jesus upon the cross, experiencing so much suffering at so many different levels, and yet believing in what all this was achieving. He never came to that point where he said, I'm not getting anywhere because the vision of the new creation was before him. It was through his life, his death upon the cross and his resurrection that he was bringing men and women, the whole of creation, under his rule. And that's why it's so important for us to hold as Paul did, the Lord Jesus Christ at the center of our faith. It's he who has taken us forward to that great and glorious end that God has promised. This is where we are moving as the people of God in our day and generation.
And may God bless us as we seek to be faithful in our mission. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for this season of spring, for brightness and warmth and colour and fragrance, all signs of new life. We thank you that this is the work of your Holy Spirit and humankind to renew us as we come to know your Son, Jesus, as his Spirit lives within us, as we are shaped according to the pattern of his life. We thank you that this renewal is promised to the whole of creation, that in the end the values embodied in Jesus will overcome everything that brings disorder and pain into our lives. We pray that you would take us forward to this day, a people whose lives show the promise of the kingdom in the way that we love, in the way that we proclaim the truth in the way we stand for justice. We remember all those throughout the world called to be kingdom people, especially those under pressure to be silent and inactive. We remember those who govern in the world and have the power to change the things that devalue and brutalize humankind. We remember our own nation in this time of pandemic that our leaders will be kept strong, our key workers kept safe, our common life free from division and disorder. We remember those we love in our families and in our circle of friendship, especially the sick, the bereaved and the troubled. And these and all our prayers we gather up in the prayer that Jesus himself has taught us to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We sing together, friends, love divine, all loves excelling.
the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.